Community Center here at CSIS, and we're really very delighted to have with us this afternoon Professor Sir Richard Feacham of the University of California. Um, before I introduce Professor Feacham, I'd like to make a few brief announcements pertaining to our work here at CSIS. First, I think many of you are aware that CSIS is currently hosting a commission on smart global health policy. Uh, the intent of that commission is by the end of the year to develop a set of recommendations on the future of U.S. global health investments looking out to the period 2010 to 2025. We're very interested in getting input from people like yourselves to that process. And in order to do that, we've created a website. I think there are some flyers in the back with the website address. It's www.smartglobalhealth.org. Um, a special promotion that we have at our website uh, this month is looking for answers to one question in particular. And that question is, what is the most important thing the U.S. can do to improve global health over the next 15 years? Um, as an incentive to get people to respond to that question, for any students um, that provide us with the best answer, we're actually going to provide $1,000 in scholarship money. And I actually think we might have some students here today from Georgetown University. So if you're interested and have time to add this to your to-do list, we'd be very interested in getting your input. We're also looking for photographs that can be incorporated into our final report, which will be a published public document and it will be formally released in either late January or early February. And of course, we give um, credit uh, to, to the photographers. But these are photos of global health programs in the field that you feel are really working. Um, so if you do have spare time, please do go to that website and we'd be very interested in hearing from you and engaging with you and getting the benefit of your, your wisdom and advice. Um, Secondly, uh, tomorrow we'll be hosting here in, in this room at 10 a.m. a book launch event. That's for uh, Dr. Bill Friss, uh, former Senate Majority Leader Bill Friss' new book, um, A Heart to Serve. Uh, Senator Frist will, will be here with us to talk about his experiences both in the Senate as in a, and as a practicing physician, and in particular his work in Africa. That'll be at 10 a.m., and again, we'd love to, to see you here with us. Um, and, and finally, I'd like to thank our CSIS staff who've been uh, instrumental to pulling together today's event. Emily Poster and Daniel Porter, uh, Seth Garin, uh, uh, Liz Morehouse, and Marie-Therese uh, Ridoff. So today we're enormously lucky to have with us Professor Richard Feachin, who has spent the last 40 years of his career working in the field of international health and development, and over that period has made many very significant contributions. Uh, I know that Professor Feacham is already very well known to a number of you. Um, I myself first had the pleasure of uh, meeting him and working with him in the early days of the Global Fund, uh, when the Global Fund was really just a concept on a piece of paper uh, that came out of a G8 meeting in Genoa. Um, and Richard's task was to turn that concept into a reality. And of course, it became a reality that ultimately benefited millions of lives and really changed how we think what is possible in the field of global health. And I think that's actually a remarkable contribution and accomplishment, um, Richard, for which the field owes you a tremendous debt of, of gratitude. Um, more formally, uh, let me tell you a little bit more about Professor Feacham. Uh, Richard Feacham is a professor of global health at both the University of California, San Francisco, and the University of California, Berkeley, and director of the Global Health Group at UCSF Global Health Sciences. From 2002 to 2007, Sir Richard served as founding executive director of the Global Fund and undersecretary general of the United Nations. Uh, during this time, the Global Fund grew to become the world's largest health financing institution for developing countries with assets of $11 billion, supporting 450 programs in 136 countries. From 1992 to 2002, Professor Feacham was the founding director of the Institute of Global Health at UCSF and UC Berkeley. And from 95 to 99, Dr. Feacham was director for health, nutrition, and population at the World Bank. And from 89 to 95, he was dean of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Professor Feacham holds a Doctor of Science degree in medicine from the University of London and a PhD in environmental health from the University of New South Wales. He was elected to membership of the Institute of Medicine in 2002 and was knighted Sir Richard by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II in 2007. 
So welcome, Richard. Very glad to have you with us this morning. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and, and thank you, Lisa, very much for the kind introduction, and thank you to uh, CSIS for the invitation to be here. Um, I'm going to uh, run through uh, a presentation on global health priorities for the 21st century uh, fairly rapidly and uh, hope that the Q&A session will be the most interesting and lively part of this event. Do stop me with a question if I'm going too fast, and then perhaps we can hold the main discussion until um, after I've been through the presentation. There is a big debate in Washington, which I don't need to uh, tell anyone here about, um, concerning global health. And it seems to me that that big debate in Washington right now has to do with three questions. Firstly, the who of global health, by which I mean what institutional arrangements and by whom are they led. I'm not going to comment on this um, other than to say, please get on with it. <laughs> My view would be that any reasonable outcome is about as good as any other reasonable outcome and that what is not helpful and reasonable is the continued delay. So please let's get on with that. That's my only comment on the who. The what of global health has exercised a lot of uh, energy, uh, quite rightly, and my presentation today will be mainly about the what, the content of the Global Health Initiative, the content of US leadership in global health over the coming years. But I also just want to draw attention to the third question, which is the how of global health, which actually, in my view, is the most important of the three questions. I won't be saying much about the how, but I think it is more important than the who or the what, and maybe can be the subject of uh, another meeting here, and I know is very much on the minds of the commission that uh, Lisa just referred to. So let's come to the what. And one of the difficulties with global health is that there's such a long shopping list of priorities. There are so many different issues which have their own passionate advocates. And we tend to get into competing micro-priorities. And I'm going to try and set a big picture to give some more order to that discussion. I think the four overarching priorities can be described as, firstly, mind the gap. Secondly, sex and chickens. I know you were expecting this. <laughs> Thirdly, eating more and less. And fourthly, the world's biggest muddle. And to me, they are the organizing principles for the global health agenda in the 21st century. And I'm going to speak very briefly to each of those to illustrate what the content is under those headings. Firstly, mind the gap. No one in this room needs reminding of what we might call the global zip code lottery of health. The accident of where you're born affects your expectation of life and your expectation of healthy life enormously. And these gaps between the fortunate and the less fortunate in terms of health and life expectancy are, in my view, and I think in all our view, not only huge, we know that from the data, but shameful, destabilizing, and very importantly, avoidable. These are not facts of life that we need tolerate. Two illustrations. Let's start with E0 which is life expectancy at birth. A girl born today in the poorest countries in the world has a life expectancy at birth of less than 40 years, and a girl born today in a wealthy country has a life expectancy at birth of more than 80 years. An enormous, shameful, and largely avoidable gap. A second statistic that helps to illustrate this is what demographers call 65Q0, the risk 
or the prospect that a girl born today will be alive on her 65th birthday. And once again, the gap is huge. A girl born today in a poor country has a less than 20% chance of being alive to celebrate her 65th birthday. And a girl born today in a wealthy country has a more than 80% chance of being alive to celebrate her 65th birthday with her children and grandchildren and maybe great-grandchildren. This again is a huge, shameful, destabilizing and largely avoidable gap. We know the causes of the gap and we know the causes of the causes of the gap. And in most cases, not in every case, but in the great majority of cases, we have the interventions to close the gap. And we know the gap can be closed because some poor countries have closed it. There are examples of developing countries with low GNP per capita who have better health status than Washington, D.C. or other parts of the United States. So we know the gap can be closed. And the message here is the Nike message, just do it. We've got to do what needs to be done. Now, part of, I'm going to just give one quick illustration. There are many others about the causes of the gap. One of the causes of the gap, and there are about a dozen major causes of the gap, but one of them is malaria. So let's just take a quick look at malaria. This was the world in 1945. A few of us in this room were alive in 1945. It's not so long ago. And red countries are countries with endemic malaria in 1945. So a red country on this map had endemic malaria somewhere within its borders in 1945. So we lived in a very malarious world. There were 200 malarious countries in the world in 1945. Today, there are only 100 malarious countries in the world. We have halved the number of countries that have endemic malaria in the world. The green countries are now malaria-free. The red countries are malarious, and the blue countries are malarious. But excitingly, the blue countries, of which there are 39, are all embarked on eliminating malaria. In other words, they're all embarked on turning green, on becoming malaria-free. And if we project forward, to 2025, we expect to see a world like this, where we're down to only about 50 malarious countries, and instead of being bright red, they are a lurid shade of pink, indicating that malaria rates have gone down enormously in the intervening period. So we're not just left with a smaller number of malarious countries. In those malarious countries, there is much less malaria. Now, I illustrate this uh, because malaria is a cause of the gap. We have made astounding progress since 1945, and we will, through the efforts of Admiral Tim Zima and others, continue to make astounding progress in the years ahead. And that will make a significant contribution to closing the gap. <laughs> Let me come to my second major topic, sex and chickens, which is my uh, euphemism for pandemics, global pandemics. Pandemics are a really, really big deal. Why is that? Because of the magnitude of the social and economic impact, they will cause tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of deaths. They will cause economic losses measured in tens and hundreds of billions of dollars. This will be a really big deal. Secondly, the vulnerability of all nations. Pandemics are not things where we can erect barriers and protect ourselves, and some countries do well and some countries don't do well. Pandemics illustrate point number three, control is not possible without global action. Pandemics are par excellence a global public good, and or global public bad. An effective response to pandemics is the global public good. And, and they are things where we all sink or we all swim. We all win or we all lose. There are no winners and losers in pandemics. This is a global phenomenon. Let's take a look at these pandemics. The one we have, HIV AIDS, I don't need to tell this audience about it. The greatest pandemic in recorded human history. This is a chronic pandemic. Chronic pandemics rise and fall over decades. The opposite would be an acute pandemic, which rises and falls over months. But here we have a chronic pandemic. It has risen over three decades, and it's got decades still to run. It is huge. It continues to grow in some parts of the world. 
And although our efforts in treatment have been highly successful, our efforts pre in prevention have been generally unsuccessful. Secondly, the uh, pandemic that creeps up on us quietly and inexorably, the pandemic of XDRTB, another chronic pandemic, and my message there is watch out. We'll hear more about that. Then the pandemic that is keeping us on the edge of our seats right now and is uh, on the news every day, H1N1, I'll say more about that. And the one that we were talking a lot about before H1N1 knocked it off the front pages, H5N1. We'll say a word more about that. Now there is one bit of good news in pandemics, which is we've had pandemics for centuries. We've documented pandemics going back hundreds and hundreds of years. But in recent times, the, uh, the range of pathogens that potentially can cause pandemics um, has shrunk, and the modes of transmission have shrunk as well. So that in the 21st century, pandemics will almost certainly be either respiratory or sexual in their transmission. And the agents that cause them will be either viruses or multiply resistant bacteria. So there's been a biological narrowing of the scope of pandemics. But that's the only bit of good news. The other things that have changed uh, are all promoting of pandemics. Firstly, there are many more of us on the planet. If you go back to the Black Plague, um, the 1350s in Europe, about 34 million people died. There were only 400 million humans on the planet. Today, there are 6.8 billion humans on the planet. So many more homo sapiens, that is promotive of larger and more devastating pandemics. Secondly, these individual members of species homo sapiens move around the world much more frequently and much more quickly, illustrated here. If you go back to 1500 and you wanted to travel from London to Hong Kong, it would take you 12 to 15 months and you would travel in a vehicle that looks like that. And in 1900, it would take you 10 weeks, and you would travel in a vehicle that looks like that. And by 1950, it would take you three days. And I love the footnote, which you probably can't read. But to go from London to, to uh, Hong Kong in that vehicle in 1950, you would actually touch down. You would start in London, and you would touch down for refueling in Frankfurt, Rome, Damascus, Basra, Karachi, Delhi, Calcutta, Rangoon, Bangkok, <laughs> and eventually to Hong Kong. So that was the way to get to Hong Kong in 1950. It would take you three days. And of course today, British Airways of course, and London to Hong Kong <laughs> in 13 hours. Now the significance of this is obvious. And to be specific, a century ago, the shortest intercontinental journey was longer than the incubation period of any infection that we might be concerned about. So you got sick on the boat, hopefully you died, we tossed you overboard, <laughs> and you didn't arrive at the new port of, uh, of entry carrying the infection. Today the opposite is the case. The, the, uh, the, the longest intercontinental journey is, is uh, oh, the longest intercontinental journey is shorter than the shortest incubation period. So you can get on a plane asymptomatic and arrive anywhere else asymptomatic and escape the, the uh, fever monitors at the airport and arrive at your hotel and give whatever it is to your fellow, uh, your fellow hotel guests or whoever you're mingling with. So very rapid human movement around the world and much more of it, simply the volume of uh, intercontinental and intercountry travel has increased enormously. Scale of deaths from pandemics in the past, very large. Um, let's go back to World War I and, um, and the famous uh, H1N1 uh, pandemic. Uh, the First World War killed about 16 million people, uh, military and civilians. The flu pandemic that immediately followed it uh, killed between 50 and 100 million people, far, far more than the war. And the majority of those were healthy adults. This was not a pandemic that killed only the very vulnerable or the old. The most people who died were healthy adults. 
The Spanish got a bad rap. It's called Spanish flu. It probably didn't originate, originate in Spain. It probably originated in the United States. So uh, we were a bit unfair to Spain there. But uh, it was huge, and it was much bigger than the war. Fast forward, 2007, for example, all global conflicts, including the war in Iraq at that time, um, killed something between 100 and 500,000 people, civilian and military, best estimates. But in the same year, AIDS, TB, and malaria killed 6 million people. So the scale of death from pandemics, when they do get going, is far greater than from wars, conflicts, terrorism, insecurities of various kinds. Now, as you know, most emerging and re-emerging infections originate from non-human animals. The zoonotic uh, overspill into humans is a very significant part of what we're experiencing. And within that, particularly if you look at flu viruses, chickens and pigs are of particular interest. And let's just take a look at chickens. I'm singling out China. This could be about Indonesia or Vietnam. But the advantage of China is that the Chinese count their chickens. Not everybody does that. Now, as Mao emphasized, not before they're hatched, of course. But they do, they do count their chickens. And if you go back to 1968, there were 12 million chickens in China. I can reliably inform you. And you come towards 2005, and wow, there are 13 billion chickens in China. And of course, Microsoft has displayed those chickens evenly distributed across the geography of China. And of course, that's not true. There aren't so many chickens in the mountains and deserts of western China. They're all piled high where the people are, i.e. in the east and southeast of China. So an enormous density of chickens with close interaction with humans. Same with pigs. The Chinese also count their pigs, which is why I'm singling out China. Go back to 1968, there were 5 million pigs in China. And today, there are more than 500 million pigs in China. And again, they're not spread out all over China, as in that picture. They're piled high in the east and, uh, and southeast of the country. So you get this very intense interaction between humans, pigs, and chickens. And that is what is driving, to a considerable degree, the, uh, the development of new influenza strains and other uh, pathogens that are potentially pandemic. When we think of a pandemic virus, we fear two properties, particularly if we're thinking about a, an acute pandemic. We fear two properties. The first property is easy human-to-human -human transmission. That's the first attribute that we fear. So let's look at that in the case of H1N1. Go back to April this year, what I call week zero of the H1N1 pandemic, Red countries are countries with confirmed cases of H1N1. Week zero, mid-April, the world looked like this. Then watch what happened. Week one, week two, week three, week four, week five, week six, week seven, week eight, week nine, week 10. Quite remarkable, 120 countries confirmed cases in 10 weeks. Now that is the product of a globalized world, rapid international transportation, and the high transmissibility of H1 from one human to another human. It's come to today, we're in 181 countries. And the reason why some countries in the world are still white is probably because they just don't have the labs to confirm it. It's probably not a true finding. Probably the whole world should be read and the number of countries should be 205, roughly. So, very easy human-to-human -human transmission. But what of the second property that we fear? The second property is a high case fatality rate, uh, a high propensity to kill those who are infected. H1N1 does not have that. That is the good news of H1N1. H1N1 is a mild form of flu with a low case fatality rate, and we hope and pray that it will stay like that because we know that it could evolve and that that could change. So far, no evidence of that. That's the good news. So we hope for a H5N1 winter that is coming up, sorry, H1N1 winter that is coming up. We know there will be large numbers of cases, but we hope that the death rate remains low because that second property of, uh, of virulence and high case fatality is not yet manifested. 
But let's remember H5N1. Remember how we were tracking H5N1, and we still are, of course. It's just not in the newspaper so much. H5N1 lacks the first property completely. It transmits with great difficulty from human to human. It's a very untransmissible virus among humans. It's very transmissible among birds. This is the so-called avian flu. But it's not very transmissible among humans. But the second property, high fatality, it certainly has. So up to the present time, there are 442 known cases of H5N1 in the world, known human cases. There are hundreds of thousands of bird cases. But human cases, there are only 442 known human cases, of whom 59% have died. So this is a very fatal virus. It has property two, but luckily, so far, it doesn't have property one. But what we are... What we are nervous about, I'm actually going to go back before I move on. What we're nervous about, quite rightly, is the emergence of acute pandemic strains, probably viruses, with both properties. Easy human-to-human -human transmission, H1N1 has it. High case fatality, H5N1 has it. If you get those in a single virus, we will have a pandemic that will really knock us down. And... The question, which I'll come back to a bit later, is are we set up globally to identify the new strain early as it emerges in a village in Java to contain it? And if we fail to identify it early and we fail to contain it, to internationally collaborate to cope effectively in terms of getting the vaccines to where they are most needed in the volumes that they're needed, the drugs, etc., the containment and coping strategies. And I think the answer to that today is a resounding no. We do not have the coping and containing strategies, and we need to evolve them. Let me come to my third big topic, which I'm calling eating more and less. In other words, the need to eat more and to eat less, depending who you are. And this refers to the dual pandemics, extraordinary dual synchronized pandemics of hunger and obesity running in parallel in the world. Let's start with hunger, global hunger. Global hunger was going down until about 1990. We were making significant progress. There was good news. Food supplies were adequate. The Green Revolution had had a big impact, particularly in South Asia and other rice-consuming areas. Um, food prices were not um, uh, beyond the, the means of poorer people. But then, around 1900, things began to turn negative, and in the last few years, things have turned very negative. And the number of hungry globally, those who go to bed every night feeling hungry, those who chronically have a calorie intake that is less than their calorie need, that number has been growing strongly and is now over one billion humans around the world. And you'll be familiar with some of the factors that have driven that. And none of those factors are going to go away quickly. Recent predictions from the World Food Program and FAO have indicated that this number of hungry in the world will continue to grow because many of the factors that are fueling it are continuing to fuel it. So this, this is a very serious issue, and we need to work to turn that curve back downwards. Where are these hungry people? Well, here is a map of hunger in the world, where dark red is more than 25% of the population hungry. And think about that. Think about more than one in four of everybody you meet every day is chronically hungry. This is a staggering social phenomenon. And, and, and phenomenon of suffering. Well, there are quite a number of countries where that's true. A larger number of countries where 5 to 25% are hungry. Those are the brown countries, and then the yellow countries under 5%, and then the white countries, no data. So that's a map of hunger in the world. What about the parallel pandemic of overeating? Um, the global satiated rather than the global hungry. 
Well, you're familiar with overweight and you're familiar with obesity. Overweight means body mass index over 25, and obesity means body mass index over 30. There are today uh, 1.6 billion overweight people in the world, and that number has been growing very rapidly. And there are 400 million obese people in the world, and that number has been growing very rapidly as well. So we have a surging pandemic of overweight and obesity. And here are the most overweight countries. More than 50% overweight. And again, stop and think about that. More than 50% overweight are the dark red countries, including our own country, the, Uni the United States. Brown, 25 to 50% overweight. Yellow, under 25% overweight. And white, no data. So you have a very interesting map of overweightness where it tends to be the more wealthy countries, uh, but not all of them, who have the biggest problem. It's interesting to look at Europe and see which parts of Europe are more overweight than which other parts of Europe. The geography of obesity. So this is the over 30 body mass index. Um, again, the bright red are the most obese, with more than a quarter of the population obese. A third of the citizens of the United States and the United Kingdom are obese now, and that proportion has been rising steadily over the last uh, decade or two. And then of particular fascination is the overlap between those two pandemics. It might have been true in former times, that countries either had a hunger problem or an obesity problem, but not both within the same borders of the same country. That is increasingly not true. And here you see in red countries that have both more than 5% of their population hungry and more than 5% of their population overweight. They have both those things at the same time. And the number of such countries um, may well grow in the years ahead. I think if we did this map 10 or 20 years ago, there might have been no countries red on the map. Now there are the countries that you see, and the number of those countries, I think, will increase in the years ahead. And although it's by no means the majority of countries, you can see it's, uh, it's uh, uh, not a very numerous number of countries, those countries do contain 53% of the world's population. So more than half of all people live in countries that have co-pandemics of hunger and overweightness. So that is my third big heading for the 21st century. Um, nutrition, both undernutrition and overnutrition. Let me come to my last heading, what I call the world's biggest muddle. Health systems, the way that we finance, organize, manage, and deliver health care. The hottest debate in town right now in the United States, and quite rightly, and in Washington, D.C., but the hottest debate in many other countries around the world as well. The United States is not alone in grappling with dysfunctions within its healthcare system. The healthcare industry is interesting. It's the world's largest industry. It consumes about $4 trillion per year, which is 10% of global GDP. That number and that percentage are rising quite rapidly. And it's, much, it's a much bigger industry than defense and the arms trade, which globally is about 6% of global GDP. That's also true in individual countries. So in the United States, for example, health care this year will be 17% of GDP. But defense is uh, uh, only, shouldn't say only, is 8%, less than half of health. So health is a very, very big business. It's a controversial business in rich and poor countries. People struggle with it, and there are significant dysfunctions. It's a hot election issue in most countries. Electorates are unhappy. Politicians are engaged. There is much argument and debate. And very strikingly is the lack of agreement. You see it in this town now, hour by hour and every day, how polarized the debates are, how different the solutions are, how there is not a convergence on common principles or common modalities to uh, 
to execute on those principles. There is such an array of strongly held opinion. And that, again, is true of the debate in many, many countries. Um, I often think that, you know, if you're in the hotel industry and you're studying case studies at business school, well, you want to be like Four Seasons because they do it well. Or if you're in the car industry and you're doing case studies at business school, you want to be like Lexus or BMW because they know how to make good cars. But if you're in healthcare, who do you want to be like? Do you want to be like the United States? Don't think so. Do you want to be like Australia? Well, maybe. Or the Netherlands. Looks good from outside, but ask a Dutch person and they'll tell you there's plenty wrong with the health systems in the Netherlands. So we don't have the role models. We don't have the systems that seem to contain many of the answers. And that's a, a, a very striking thing about this huge healthcare industry. If we come to the low and middle income countries, what is the challenge exactly? Well, in a nutshell, it's poor access to low quality. In a healthcare system, we aspire to three things. Good access to high quality at affordable cost. That is the essence of all healthcare systems. And across the low income countries and many of the middle income countries, we actually have the very opposite of that. We have poor access to low quality. And that's what we're grappling with in 150 low and middle income countries. What is the dimension of the crisis? What is the nature of the crisis? It's deep and it's broad. And I think we have to emphasize this. It has to do with finance. There is a big finance deficit. There are not sustainable ways of financing the healthcare system that the country would like to have. And that's also true of the United States. Look at the Medicare projections. We don't have a sustainable financing plan. Secondly, infrastructure would not apply to the United States, but strongly applies to the lower middle income countries. Derelict infrastructure, clinics and hospitals with leaking roofs, and no proper sanitation, and unreliable water supplies, and no reliable electricity, and no reliable tele telecommunications to call for the ambulance to take the obstetric emergency to hospital when she needs it, even if there was an ambulance to come if you had the telecommunications. So an enormous deficit in infrastructure, and then, of course, on the right-hand side of that pie chart, the service <laughs> delivery deficits, which are broad and deep in themselves. Management, quality assurance, human resources, supply chain, and much, much more. So in health system strengthening, we really have got our, got our work cut out collectively around the world. There are not easy answers. There are only long-term and challenging solutions, but it's a, a topic that we must address with much more cohesion and much more seriousness. And part of addressing the problem will be to bring back, to embrace the large, anarchic, unregulated, atomized private sector which exists in all low and middle income countries. In Africa, which has the smallest private healthcare sector of any continent, look at the statistics. The private sector in Africa provides about 50% of all care. In 2005, about $16.5 billion was spent on healthcare in Africa, of which 60% were out of pocket, i.e. privately financed and not through insurance, through out of pocket. And out of pocket payment in an African country or in India or across the low or lower middle income world means that your risk pool is the extended family. Risk pools are critical to health financing. And if you're paying out of pocket, your, your risk pool is your extended family. And that's the worst possible risk pool to be part of. You share the same genes. You share the same income, typically, like you're all poor. Not a good thing. You share the same environment because you live near and with each other. And you share the same pathogens because you have sex with each other and you sneeze on each other and you shake each other's hands every day and you use the same toilets. This is the worst risk pool to be part of. A really, really bad idea. I want to be in a risk pool with people I've never met and I'm not related to. If they're all in Salt Lake City, I'm really, really happy. And, and, and I don't want to ever meet them. I don't want to share any of these things, genes or income or environment or pathogens. That's a happy risk pool to be part of. So, big, big issue where you have a, a high proportion of care that is financed by out-of-pocket payment. 
And the point I'm making here is that as we move forward on health system strengthening, we've got to get serious about bringing private uh, health care providers into the task of delivering public policy goals. It's all about conscripting this large, unregulated, anarchic private system um, into the achievement of public policy goals and working with government. Let me quickly mention in conclusion three cross-cutting dimensions. I've mentioned four big baskets of priority. Mind the gap, sex and chickens, pandemics, eating more and eating less, the two nutritional challenges, and finally, health system strengthening. Let me take on three cross-cutting dimensions which I think are very important. The need for multi-sectoriality, the need for integration, and the need for global joint action. On the multi-sectoral, it's obvious, but we need to emphasize it, solutions will lie from genetics, from molecular biology, from the most basic laboratory sciences, which are exploding in their potential to bring us new useful tools, right down to global governance. The pandemic issue illustrates that very well, and everything in between. This is a very interdisciplinary and multi-sectoral effort. Integration. It's interesting that I hear that in Washington, the debate which the global health and population health community have had for the last 30 years and think they put to bed about 20 years ago has now raised its head again. And the dreaded words vertical versus horizontal are back in discussion. We thought we'd laid all that to rest, but I hear them bubbling up. So a quick word about integration. The vertical approach, as it's sometimes called, focusing on particular conditions and diseases. The horizontal approach, as it's sometimes called, focusing on the strengthening of health systems. And then we invented the diagonal approach to keep everybody happy, which is some of both, and recognize the importance of both. But we really need to go beyond that. We really need to go beyond that in, in the integration of our thinking between the achievement of very targeted and specific objectives and the broader strengthening of a healthcare system that is able to cope with both today's and tomorrow's health challenges. We should not forget the spectacular successes and momentum that have come from a focus on the specific. The response to HIV AIDS since the turn of the century, the work in malaria, the work in TB, the eradication of smallpox, the progress on child mortality, on immunization, on polio, on neglected tropical diseases, some of which are disappearing from the world during our lifetimes. There has been remarkable progress from a focused approach, and we must maintain that momentum. And a contributor to um, recognizing this remarkable progress, and therefore to maintaining this momentum, is the Living Proof Project, um, launched by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and I, I recommend it to you, for those of you who haven't been on this new website and seen uh, the, uh, the, uh, the messages coming from the Living Proof Project. It's all about celebrating success, it's all about being frank about challenges, and it's all about maintaining momentum, because the successes have been spectacular and must not be wished away or forgotten. And the successes have been in a variety of areas. And you'll find progress sheets on these and other areas on the Living Proof uh, Project website. But while recognizing that, we've got to get better at what this diagram tries to illustrate. Health systems do have to be strengthened. And they have to be strengthened partly by efforts against particular causes of mortality and morbidity, and surrounding efforts which are generic, which are polyvalent, like strengthen management, strengthen surveillance, strengthen infrastructure, strengthen supply chain, strengthen laboratories. But in a context of maintaining the pressure on malaria, maintaining the pressure on HIV, not losing momentum where we have strikingly achieved it against specific enemies against specific causes of the gap that I referred to earlier. And I think uh, over the next few years, our thinking on this kind of integration 
will become more sophisticated. And finally, my third uh, cross-cutting issue is what I call global joint action. This idea that the world must act together to achieve the goals that we collectively wish to achieve. And that isn't equally true for every aspect of global health. And I think it helps to give a bit of light and shade to that. So I've invented a new uh, scale. I dreamt it up. It's called the go it alone scale in global health. And it measures the degree to which you can go it alone rather than work by deliberate and relentless collaboration with your neighbors, with your region, and with countries worldwide. If you get one on the scale, you can go it alone. I win, you whatever. And if you get 10 on the scale, it's we all win, we all lose, we all sink, we all swim. And just to provoke this debate, for Mind the Gap, I would give it a score of three. And I'm mindful of successes that have been made. If you look at Kerala compared to its neighbors in India, it does show that you can close the gap dramatically, even if your immediate neighbors, even in the same country, are doing much less well than you are. World's biggest muddle, health systems, I give that a five, partly because of the global market for healthcare workers, which I think is playing a bigger and bigger role in the ability of countries to strengthen their healthcare systems. Eating more and less, I think, is a very global subject. I give it a seven. I think we've got to attack this globally. And sex and chickens, I give a 10. There are no winners and losers in pandemics. It's we're all in the same boat, and we've got to tackle it collectively. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Thanks very much, Richard. You, you've given us an awful lot to think about in, in a very interesting way. Um, but I, I think you've also given us a first here at CSAS. I've not been here very long myself, but I doubt there has ever before been a lecture, a subtitle of which was Sex and Chicken. So, so thank you for bringing that to us today. Um, I'm sure there are a number of questions uh, in the audience. I think what we'll try to do is group them in three. Um, if that's all right with you. Uh, please, when you pose your question, please identify yourself by name and organization. And please just make sure your question is mostly a question and not a, not a statement. So um, please, the floor is yours. Um, Ed Scott, please. And, and could I ask you all please to use the mics that will be brought to you, because we are going to webcast this later on. So thanks. Hi, I'm Ed Scott. I'm with the, <coughs> excuse me, the Center for Global Development. It's always great to listen to you, Richard, because you speak with such clarity and wisdom. Um, my question is about the, the global health management dilemma, and I'd like to get your take on it. If, um, if some scientist woke up tomorrow and, could, uh, and realized and could conclusively demonstrate that the H5N1 virus was all of a sudden going to be very transmissible human to human, um, how do you foresee the global governance system slash global health governance system responding? And do you feel like uh, they've got the, uh, the thoughtfulness and the resolve to get after a situation like that? And, and specifically within that, how would the Chinese respond? Because they'd probably be the ones right at the epicenter of it. Thanks. Uh, another question from the floor? Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Stephen Satimi. I work with USAID Bureau of Global Health. Um, I would like you to maybe comment a little further on the term multi-sector. Uh, you look at your score of the, uh, the, the ranking, the, the me, I win, you something, 10 of us win, you know, we all lose. What I keep seeing a lot is, is that the, it seems like the health sector is thinking as, a, as being themselves, as we will do this, and you, what do you do? So I see health folks working in infrastructure development, information systems, electrification, et cetera, et cetera, well outside the domain of health. What is the multi-sector approach 
to development. If we only think of sectors as TB, HIV, malaria, but those aren't sectors, those are sections of health. So maybe comment on that a bit. He's right in the middle here. Thank you. Uh, Larry Kazaza with ACAM African Communities Against Malaria. Good to see you again, sir. Uh, following up on this integration issue, after having lived in East Africa the last two years through the turmoil of the post-election violence, and hearing today that Kenya has 15 million Gates Foundation dollars missing, feeding into the treasuries of the politicians gearing up for the next presidential election. My question is this, thinking outside the box, which is our, our global health technical issues, who is addressing these other very pressing points, and you mentioned destabilization, because the, pop, the, the demographic dividend in Africa is going to erupt in more violence. And we can't be thinking just about our health technical expertise, but how to broaden the discussion in political, economic, and social issues uh, as well. Thank you. Let's take those three and then we'll come back for a second round. Oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. So thank you very much for the questions. Um, Ed, great to see you again. Um, H5N1, um, a scenario, H5N1 acquired the second property which we fear, um, easy human-to-human -human transmission. Um, are we today in a strong response mode? Uh, my answer would be a resounding no. Um, are we likely to catch this strain very early uh, in a part of rural China or Vietnam or Indonesia or wherever it emerges, catch it very early, and then work internationally with the local authorities to contain it? Likely not, likely not. So likely that it's, you know, that it's, at SFO and at LAX before we, before we know it. So the global spread is underway. And it's then, in this scenario, very fatal. Um, we can then expect a devastating pandemic um, with deaths well into the tens of millions worldwide and economic consequences into the trillions because normal life will stop. Nobody will go to work. Uh, normal transactions will end. Uh, at the moment, to avoid H5N1, you want to be not intimate with chickens and meet as few chickens in your day as you can arrange to not meet with. I've met no chickens today. But when this new property comes to H5N1, it's fellow human beings who I will want not to meet. And so normal normal life will come to an end. People will stay at home. And um, the economic consequences will be huge. And I think there is a big building task, and a big building task where the US can play a huge role to create a global architecture to make the future different from what I've just described. To create the global surveillance networks, the complete transparency in sharing information and sharing viruses the agreed collaborative responses, getting away from national sovereignty. This is my business. Don't shine a light on my country. None of your business. Well, of course, it's everybody's business. So opening up the national sovereignty debates and getting a genuine collaboration in identification early, containment, strenuous global efforts. Um, we're a long way from that today, but I think it's absolutely doable, and I think it's a wonderful area for health diplomacy and smart U.S. health foreign policy and U.S. foreign policy more broadly. The response of China, I think SARS was the tipping point for China. Uh, China moved, because of SARS, from a huge degree of non-transparency to a huge degree of transparency. And we first saw that with HIV AIDS, 
where in a matter of a couple of years they move to a great degree of transparency on HIV uh, AIDS. I think today they are very transparent. Uh, could it be more? Yes, it could be. Uh, could it be more openly collaborative? Please come, your scientists, and work with our scientists, and yes, one can make further progress. But the, but the country at the moment that is very, very non-collaborative and, and a far cry from what I've just described is Indonesia. And that's a product of the, of the lack of trust in the world, which we have to somehow get over. Um, Stephen, um, health and, and other sectors, and what do we mean by sector? Yeah, I take your point absolutely. I mean, I think um, the health industry can't say this is all for us. So if there is a, you know, if there is an IT need, if there is a, a need clearly in another sector, we've got to do it. No, I mean, that can't be the way that it is. We, we have got to bring in that sense a multi-sectoral approach so that, um, you know, take a couple of obvious examples, um, those who deal with taxation have got to be our allies on tobacco. Those who deal with the food industry and food labeling and food culture have got to be our allies on obesity. Um, those who deal with um, um, transport and um, bicycle-friendly cities have also got to be our our allies on obesity, et cetera, et cetera. So there's got to be the real kind of multi-sectoral approach that you were, I think, advocating for. And the, the last point, Larry, on all the other things that are going on that we've got to be aware of, absolutely, and, and, and you started with shining a light on a, on a recent corruption story. Um, you know, I think that brings us, you remember at the beginning I had the who and the what, which we've spoken mainly about, and then the how. I think the how is incredibly important, and I think this architecture of how the new Obama administration global health initiative will do its business, what will be the details of the business model, and within that, how will the issues of corruption and misuse of funds be dealt with. I think the Global Fund has taught us a lot about that, and you know, I hope enough people are listening and learning because the application of some of those principles to bilateral U.S. foreign assistance, I think, could improve that situation significantly. Not to say for a moment that no global fund money has been stolen. I'm absolutely sure, well, I absolutely know that it has been. Um, but has that happened less and with a stronger response when it has happened and have we known about it more um, than in other major development finance arrangements, I think the answer to all those questions is yes. So we've got to internalize some of the recent learnings, and we've got to think a lot about the how of foreign assistance, the exact business model that is used to transfer resources from a very wealthy country to many much less wealthy countries. Let's do another three questions. There's a gentleman in the back there. Behind you, Marie Tres. No. Hi, uh, David Gold from Global Health Strategies in New York. Uh, Richard, thanks for a, a very thought-provoking presentation. I was uh, struck by you at the end when you talked about the potential challenges between horizontal and vertical approaches to global health. And obviously, there's cases to be made for each approach. Uh, coming from you know, being an AIDS activist early on, you could, you know, we're kind of used to making the case for the s disease approach. It's advocacy generating new revenues. You can measure responses pretty quickly. And obviously there's a strong case we made for the systems approach. The challenge when, when, when I saw your slides for me was the rubber hits the roads, as you know, probably better than anyone when you're talking to donors. Sort of where do they allocate those? You know, how much to each, basically. And I was wondering, given your experience both as a, a health professional and as the leader of the organization that deals perhaps more with single diseases than anyone, how you try to, what are the factors that drive the allocation in a world where there's increasingly limited resources for growing demands in global health? And up front here, please. I'm Daniel Wale from AED. 
Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I'm very much in support of integration. But I also noticed that most of the living proofs that you mentioned, smallpox, progress in malaria, progress with polio, have actually come with deliberate targeted approaches to these public health issues. And therefore, I wonder what you think as the middle way. I'm not talking of diagonal now, but if we are going to make a headway in any of these issues like H1N1, it's probably going to be a kind of, quote, vertical approach. So how do we weigh that vis-a-vis -vis the integration that you, you're talking about? Thank you. Is there another question someone would like to pose? Please. Thank you. Adam Sloat uh, from USAID Bureau for Global Health. Um, you mentioned in terms of non-communicable diseases, you mentioned obesity. I was wondering what your thoughts are about tobacco use and specifically what you feel the role for the U.S. government should be regarding tobacco use in the developing world and whether, for instance, we should be using scarce resources to address it or whether that's something that is better put off for later. Um, any of your thoughts on that would be appreciated. Well, again, three, three great comments and questions. And perhaps I could combine the first two because they were in the same territory. Um, and it comes to integration, the old debate of vertical versus horizontal. And I think the first thing to emphasize again, as you so well stated, that our dramatic successes in global health up to the present time have been in focused areas. We eradicated smallpox. We drove down a whole range of specific diseases, dramatically in some cases. And some are now approaching eradication guinea worm, polio. Um, some are fading from the landscape, leprosy, um, because of focused approaches. So I think message one must be don't let go of the focused approaches. It's where the track record has been. It will generate the donor money. Uh, I'll come back to the generation of the donor money. And we mustn't let go of those things. I think what we must do is add two additional things. Firstly, to ensure that our investment in focused problems is a polyvalent investment. For malaria elimination in southern Africa, where my group from San Francisco is much engaged at the moment, we need better laboratories. The laboratory deficit is stunning, stunning when you begin to look at it. But those better laboratories, which might come about from a malaria investment, will be polyvalent. They can do lots of other things, including identify H1N1 and do CD4 counts and viral loads. I mean, laboratories cannot and never would be single test laboratories. It makes no sense. Um, so there are many opportunities to invest polyvalently in our focus programs. And I think we've just got to get better at doing that and talk about it more. Look what I did to supply chain in this country for an antiretroviral drug purpose. But having done it, it serves many purposes. So I think that's one really important theme for the years ahead. And the second really important theme, I think, is to, in parallel, take health systems seriously and offer support country by country. I don't think that means necessarily spending a large amount of money. I think it does mean addressing, in each country where we're working, the systemic questions. I think the international community should be very cautious about dreaming up health system solutions in Washington, Geneva, London, or anywhere, and saying, Lucky Malawi, we have thought through the solutions to your health systems crisis. 
we see a lot of hubris around this. And I think it's very dangerous. I think health system solutions will be country by country. They're very history and culture dependent. Health systems, uh, we hear this phrase a lot in Afghanistan right now, you start from where you are, not from where you'd like to be. And I think that is super true in the health systems debate. You start from where you are, and solutions and pathways and next steps will be country specific. And I think uh, wealthy countries and supporters should offer support, but let the policies be driven locally and follow the leads of the younger generation of policymakers in those countries, who I think are really thinking along very exciting lines right now. They're way ahead of the World Health Organization, for example. So don't let the World Health Organization drag them back into some prior view of what a health system should look like. So those are the things I think we need to bring together. On the donor question, there has been, donors, donors respond to results. Donors respond to a clearly identified problem, alongside which is a clearly identified solution to that problem, if only we had the money to deliver it. And then in a few years' time, results, results, results from applying that solution to that problem. That's what drove the Global Fund, plus HIV activism, a big dose of HIV activism, plus that promise is what drove the Global Fund, and it's what will continue to drive things. The challenge for health systems is to have that clearly identified problem, to have that clearly identified approach to that problem, and beware, beware the solutions dreamt up in Washington. But there needs to be a sort of modality for moving forward that will convince a hard-nosed person. And then we need to see results. And I think today we have none of those. We don't have a good characterization of the problem. We don't have clear modalities for engaging in the problem. And we don't have a string of good results to put on the table to say, well, look what we did. Let's do more of that. So we've got some way to go. But um, results, 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 starting with clear problem and clear response. The last point was... Uh, about NCDs in general and, and tobacco, particularly. Um, yes, a very important area. Uh, I chose to touch on only obesity as obviously a major NCD driver. It's not the only NCD driver, but it's a very significant NCD driver. If we see a world which, in which the poor world has caught up with the rich world in tobacco abuse, so if we can get to a world where tobacco abuse is declining everywhere, as it has been for some time in the wealthy world, then tobacco as a driver of NCDs will begin to uh, fade, and obesity as a driver of NCDs will become more and more prominent. And, and of course, in this country, it's already extremely prominent. Um, but more broadly, um, I, yes, I think the U.S. should definitely engage in... in for example, tobacco discussions. I think we have a lot of evidence about the nature of the problem and successful solutions to the problem. And I think it's a question of sharing that evidence. And I think country after country, uh, we will see governments embrace the tobacco abuse epidemic, embrace an understanding of the devastating effect on the health of its people, firstly men, and then as women behave like men, they die like men. So. As, as female smoking rates rise, so female lung cancer rates rise. It's all totally predictable. And it did happen in our country in, in uh, former years. Um, and getting that information out and getting the solutions out, you know, the, the various things that California and, and Australia and other places have done to make smoking uh, a, a relative rarity. And in California, impossible to practice. <laughs> no way you can do it now. Uh. Richard, I'm going to pose a follow-up question on the uh, vertical horizontal issue, um, which is there's been now a new, um, it's no longer a proposal, I think it's actually a plan put forth out of the UN General Assembly in September to create a new financing mechanism modeled on the IFF that would channel funds to both Global Fund and Gavi to do more intensified health system strengthening. So I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, and one frequently hears, well, shouldn't we maybe have a 
global fund for gender-related health needs or a global fund model for another type of vertical intervention. You know, I'm wondering what your opinion is of how one can multitask um, institutions like the Global Fund and Gavi to take on in a more systematic type of way some of these enduring challenges like the health system strengthening challenge. Is that something that in your view has serious potential to really make a difference? The one word answer is, is no. Um, you know, I follow with great interest the work of the task force and, and the recommendations that eventually arose, and, and I think it's a very good report with a lot of good content. I think the, the, the part of the report that you're referring to particularly um, is the wrong direction. Uh, for two or three reasons that, I mean, this is a long debate. We could, we, we could easily spend two days in this room on this subject, and I think perhaps we should do, because I think it's, it's a very important and a very now topic. But my concern about what the task force has recommended um, is the following. Firstly, um, dilution of focus for the Global Fund and for Gabby. The work of the Global Fund is not yet done and the work of Gavi is not yet done. They both face large financial shortfalls right now. I mean, the Global Fund Technical Review Panel has just made its recommendations on round nine. The board will meet quite soon to make decisions on round nine, and round nine will be massively underfunded. So there is unfinished business, to put it mildly, with the Global Fund and with Gavi immunization rates are not yet where they need to be. And what about the new vaccines? What about pneumococcal vaccines in wide use? What about rotavirus vaccines in wide use? What about um, HPV vaccines for teenage girls in wide use in the developing world? This is a long way to go, and these are a really important vaccine delivery tasks. So large unfinished business with the Global Fund and Gavi and I'm just uh, shocked at how little attention is drawn to that. Secondly, um, the implausibility to me of either the Global Fund with its current design and staffing and arrangements or Gavi with its current design, staffing and arrangements being the competent vehicle for financing health system strengthening. Um, I, I think that is a, 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 an, an implausible suggestion. And the third comment I'll make is that um, in 2005, I think it was, um, around then, Paul Wolfowitz and I commissioned a report on the business of the Global Fund and the business of the World Bank wanting uh, an incisive viewpoint on who should do what, because we were beginning to trip over each other in an unhelpful way. And so we commissioned uh, an incredibly competent former World Bank staff member called Alex Shackow. Some of you will know him. And he produced a report called the Shackow Report, which I hope is still somewhere on the Global Fund website for those of you who'd like to see it. I recommend the reading of that report because it set out the comparative advantage and core competences of the Global Fund and concluded the Global Fund should have this emphasis because of that, and the comparative advantages and core competences of the World Bank, and therefore building on that emphasized where the World Bank should put its efforts. And if I summarize the Shakar report in two sentences, it was Global Fund stick with AIDS, TB, and malaria, but find those opportunities for the polyvalent investments, so it's not that you're not putting money into health systems. You are putting money into health systems, but through AIDS, TB, and malaria. And World Bank, for goodness sake, stop having every product line in the global health supermarket and focus on health system strengthening. Because who else has the scope and the scale to take that on comprehensively, policy-wise, multi-sectoral, a lot to do with ministries of finance, a lot to do with ministries of finance, where the global fund has the uh, where the sorry, where the World Bank has the relationship. So the message was: World Bank, 
please take health systems seriously and do so partly by getting out of other product lines. Didn't happen. <laughs> Didn't happen. So my recommendation would be that we should sit and seriously revisit that particular recommendation for the task force and come up with something that is much more pragmatic and likely to move us forward in a coherent way. How do you spell the name for the report? It's the Shaka report, S-H-A-K-O-W. And the first name, Alex. And it should be somewhere, but maybe deep, in the Global Fund website. Uh, unless it's been censored in uh, there's always a way to find things on the web. So, <laughs> uh, we have probably time for one or two more questions, please, Scott. Thank you, uh, Lisa uh, Scott Everts. Uh, my affiliation is now me, um, Lisa. I'm going to break a ground rule that you stated at the beginning. I'm going to make a statement because you actually stole my question about the World Health Assembly's task force and the recommendation for a global um, fund for other things, um, Richard. When I served on the U.S. delegation to the Global Fund, I'm sure you thought that we uh, existed to be a thorn in your side. And there were many days when um, we were in conflict. But I just want to thank you for working so positively with our delegation, uh, the others of the developed, uh, the donor countries and the recipient countries, to really help create a, an incredible institution that um, is in large part your legacy. Um, we all owe you a debt of gratitude. That was going to be my statement, which preceded my question that Lisa has already asked. So it's a pleasure to see you, Richard. And thank you again for your leadership. It really is. It's very rewarding to see. Well, if I can just say, oh. I, I applaud, too, because the, uh, the achievement, such as it is, is, is shared by many people, including the aforementioned U.S. delegation on the board of the Global Fund, which I think made a huge contribution, and your own contribution, Scott, was, was enormous, and I deeply appreciate it. And I think one of the singular contributions, there were many, of the U.S. delegation on the board of the Global Fund was the relentless, the relentless mantra of focus. And I think that is as relevant today as it was then. And I hope that, I mean, it is an important piece of sort of Washington engineering. We've got to ensure that the U.S. voice on the board of the Global Fund and the board of Gavi and the board of the World Bank are joined up on these issues. They are powerful voices, and they need to be joined up around a single coherent view of how this conversation should go forward. I suspect, I'll shoot myself if I'm wrong, but I suspect that that joined upness is not fully in place right now. So I think, Richard, what we should do at this point, since we're approaching 1.30, is to thank you very much uh, for your time, for the presentation. I suspect many people would like to take you up on the offer to come back and have a further conversation on some of these issues. So maybe we'll see if we can sort that out. Um, I'd like to also thank all of you for spending some time with us this afternoon and for your great questions. I hope to see you again soon. Thanks. Mm -hmm.